Uh, hey guys, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, yeah, so as Akanksha introduced me, um, I'm Anish Asthana. I'm a software engineer on the Data Hub team in the AI Center of Excellence at Red Hat. And I'm Daniel Wolf, senior data engineer within the products and technologies organization. Yeah, and um, we're here to talk to you about machine learning with open source infrastructures. Uh, more specifically, we'll be talking about um, the Open Data Hub and um, one of our internal users, like the Grocket team. So the Open Data Hub was originally started um, to address some internal problems we were facing around machine learning at Red Hat. Instead of having a number of different teams manage their own infrastructure, you know, develop their own support mechanisms and like security policies, we figured having a centralized location called the Data Hub where teams could share data and run their ML and AI workloads made more sense. That way we could free our end users from having to worry about the complexities of managing these systems and then focus on what is really interesting to them, right? Like experimentation, getting inside, building cool stuff. Um, the Open Data Hub is a natural evolution of that. Um, it, is an, it is a meta open source project that brings together a number of open source technologies in like data and machine learning pipelines all running on Kubernetes, or in our case, OpenShift. Uh, one important thing to note is that it's cloud agnostic, so you can run anywhere, you can run OpenShift. So if you want to run on AWS, or on-prem, or on GCE, feel free to do so, right? Or on all three of them at the same time. Um, you can find a community at opendatahub.io. So this is a reference architecture diagram for the Open Data Hub. I know it looks like a lot, but I'll walk you through it. Um, the components you can see in this uh, diagram get, oh, sorry, uh, can be broken into roughly three categories. Um, the first category is technologies or products, we, projects we are looking into and vetting to see if they would really fulfill the needs we have. So things like um, Red, Red Hat Data Grid or 3Span would sort of fit in there. Um, the second set of components is Technologies we have proved work for us internally and meet our requirements, but we haven't integrated yet into the Open Data Hub operator. And the third set, and so like technologies for that would be like um, Elasticsearch, for example, or Hue. Um, and the third set of technologies and projects is stuff that we've proved works and is a part of the operator. So if you draw your attention to the bottom of the image, um, you'll see OpenShift. So OpenShift is Red Hat's enterprise Kubernetes distribution. Um, it's a container orchestration engine, so and that's what we're running Open Data Hub on. Um, this is what lets us scale up to meet any requirements or run on any cloud. Moving up a little bit, um, you can see like the data engineer persona on the left. So data engineers are responsible for building out big data infrastructures. What this really means is that they're responsible for developing and like planning out systems that can incorporate data from different sources and store it in one like, location or multiple, I guess, for your users to like play with, so to speak. Um, data engineers are generally dealing with two main types of um, datas, datas. Um, data in motion, which is like data that may be flowing from outside your system into your system, right, like from point A to point B, and then data in rest, which is data that's already in your system, how are you storing it effectively? So <clears throat> with those like two sort of categories um, defined, um, we are using Kafka, uh, Logstash, and FluentD primarily internally, and um, as part of the Open Data Hub operator, you can use Kafka. And then from a storage perspective, um, we settled on using Ceph as our data lake for unstructured data. Um, we're looking into Red Hat Data Grid um, as an in-memory storage option. And then for your structured data, you can really use any database you like. Um, we use Post PostgreSQL for the most part. Is it you need one from the data in motion layer and one from the storage layer at least to, to do this? Or is it yes. Like yeah. Um, yeah, you can have more. We have, depending on your infrastructures, you may have multiple. So some of our internal users, um, they have 
oh, their systems have integrations built in with our syslog, so it made sense for us to incorporate that. Um, but yeah, you can use any, you really need only one from each layer. Uh, so once you have your data in your data lake, you, you're not done yet, right? You need to actually get some insight or value out of that data. And this is where your data scientists and your business analysts come into the picture. Um, if there's just some light visualization work they want to do, you know, just get a very rough idea of what the data may look like. And they, um, you can use projects like Hue, Kibana, or Superset to look into it. But if your data scientist wants to do something a little more involved, right, like with processing data or transforming it or starting to train models on it, they can use Jupyter Hub alongside Spark with whatever, you know, Python or whatever language of choice you like uh, with whatever lang um, machine learning libraries you want to use. Now, once your data scientist is done with, like, creating a model, they probably want to deploy it somewhere so that you have end users sort of testing it out, right? So for that, we're using Selden to serve models um, which our data scientists have de developed. The final bit I want to talk about in that portion is actually about the Open Data Hub AI library. Um, the AI library is a set of um, pre-built statistical and machine learning modules that any user can download and um, can quickly get started with for rapid prototyping. So say if I'm not a data scientist, but I have a lot of data and I want to sort of test out what I can do with it, you can download the AI library and sort of get started with some prototyping work fairly easily. Now if you look over to the other side of the diagram, um, <clears throat> you'll see the data, st data steward. So these folks are responsible for restricting access to your data or to your platform, right? They're interested in just authentication and credentials. So for them, internally, we have, yep. Do you, do you have any um, um, developer ID or something to support that? So Jupyter Hub is, yeah, Jupyter Lab, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we actually have it running and you can deploy it as part of the operator. Oh. Uh, so just to clarify, we have Jupyter Notebook, oh, sorry. Jupyter Hub, uh, Jupyter Lab, we're currently looking at the integrations for that. We don't quite have that in the deployment. Yes, you can. Yeah. It, it would integrate perfectly fine with it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, where was I? Oh, yeah. So your data stewards are concerned with restricting access to your data. So for them, um, we have, like, currently we're using Red Hat, um, OpenShift OAuth, and um, the Ceph object store for credential management. And with o in the case of OpenShift OAuth, you can integrate with LDAP. So it's very easy to restrict access to certain um, components which are sensitive. Finally, you have your DevOps engineers, right? Um, these guys are the ones who are responsible for keeping the lights on. So they're interested in monitoring um, the health of the system, right? Seeing if something is down, how the system is performing with like metrics. For that use case, we have settled on using Prometheus and Grafana since they provide a pretty easy way to scrape metrics and visualize them. The last thing I want to talk about is um, jobs, right? Like you, you have jobs, uh, your users may have jobs they need to run on a semi-regular basis, right? And they can vary in scope from something simple like um, backups for like your elastic search indices to something a lot more complicated for like some data transformations for like a multi-stage data transformation for your machine learning modules. Um, you could use cron jobs for that, but they're not very robust and not very reliable, right? Like if they fail, you have no idea what happened. To that end, we settled on using um, Argo and Jenkins to manage our jobs. Um, this is not just revision, right? We do have some components already integrated in. And um, if you were to go to the GitLab repository and download the operator, um, here's what you can deploy out of the box. So you can deploy Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring, obviously. Um, Selden, Spark, and Jupyter Hub for data processing, analysis, and then model serving. And then finally, Ceph and Kafka for your data storage, data and motion needs. Um, to answer that, gen that gentleman's question, you don't have to deploy any component here if you don't want to. So if you like Jupyter Lab a lot and you don't care about Jupyter Hub, you can just tell the operator not to deploy Jupyter Hub, and Jupyter Lab will be able to slot in there perfectly, right? The operator just makes it easy to deploy like a 
get a prototype going. Um, next, I'll be talking a little bit about some of our deploy practical deployments right now. The first one I'm going to talk about is for the Massachusetts Open Cloud, or MOC for short. Uh, the MOC is a collaboration between a number of universities in the greater Boston area, as well as some industry partners, <coughs> to create an open public cloud um, for you know, researchers in, in academia or like nonprofits or in an industry to collaborate on and innovate in. We have an open data hub deployment in the MOC, right, to provide a platform for these researchers and nonprofits to develop AI services on and like again, collaborating on and driving value for them. Um, as a side note, if you are a researcher or a nonprofit in the greater Boston area and you're interested in working with the MOC, feel free to reach out. We can put you in touch with some folks there. Um, and then the second bit I'm talking about is the internal data hub, right, which is where it all started. Um, we have three main goals internally. Right. The first two are somewhat linked together, so I'll talk about them together. Um, we want to serve as customer zero for any new Open Data Hub components, and we want to prove that the Open Data Hub can run in a highly, highly available manner at scale. Um, to expand on that, right, um, all of these new technologies and running all of these, running and installing all of these new technologies and projects on OpenShift isn't always the easiest thing to get started with. Working through all of these, you know, those kinks that come with getting started and like sharing that knowledge upstream is going to make life easier for everyone who's in the community, right? Going forward from there, running at scale requires, again, very specific configurations, which may not be obvious initially, right? There's specific things you have to do. So as we have um, processed large volumes of data and stored it for our internal customers, right, we've learned a lot of lessons and we've been contributing them upstream to the Open Data Hub um, community. Finally, um, we also want to help drive teams at Red Hat to be more data-centric. Um, and to that end, you know, we're creating blog posts, talks, videos, demos. I'm sure you've seen some talks about some of the work people have done. You'll probably see more of them over the next few days. And, um, you know, some of these use cases can be like, I don't know, hard drive failure prediction in Ceph, for example, right? Like, these are useful things. and there's a lot of data, but not everyone thinks that they can do these sort of applications. On that note, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our internal customers. Um, the first one I want to touch on is the products and technology DevOps team. Um, they have applications in their build and product release pipelines that are generating a lot of logs. All of these logs are stored in the data hub. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, not all logs are created equally, right? Like some of them actually really matter. Most of them are just silly debug things no one cares about, right? So detecting these... Um, <laughs> well, you don't care about it until that particular component breaks. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, detecting like these important logs is like anomaly detection is something that some of our the PND DevOps teams are actually engaging with the AI Center of Excellence on. And um, if you're interested in learning more about one of these, um, there's a talk later this afternoon by um, Michael Clifford and Zach Hassan talking about their experiences building an anomaly detection model for that. Um, <clears throat> we also have um, cluster, met cluster operational metrics for OpenShift clusters flowing into the data hub for the telemetry project. Um, this is all information about, you know, like how the clusters are behaving once they're deployed, um, what the health of the system looks like, and it's helping like OpenShift VMs or tech leads make decisions on what future work they need to do or what features they need to prioritize or what people don't actually really care about. On a similar note, somewhat similar, um, we also have a lot of customer insights data in the data hub. This is data from things like Red Hat Insights or source reports, right, for the customers and um, we have a number of teams internal to Red Hat using that data um, to improve the decision making, right? Like this way they can know what work to prioritize, what maybe what customer partnerships to, or ISV partnerships to pursue, um, and you know, things in that vein again, right? Making smarter decisions with that data. Uh, one of these teams, uh, one of the teams working with the insights data is the Grocket team. Um, so I'll hand it over to Daniel now to talk about that. All right. Thanks, Nish. 
All right, that was great. Um, so yeah, let's see. So uh, you're kind of again. My name is Daniel Wolf, senior data engineer, and you're kind of going to get a two for one talk uh, because we heard about the Open Data Hub infrastructure from Anish, and now we're going to hear about an actual use case that we're building with Open Data Hub. So I'm going to cover some slides with some background and uh, get into a little bit of detail, and then tr transition to Jupyter Notebook and look at some code. So the name of our internal application is Grokket, G-R-O-K-K-E-T, and this comes from the word grok, which means to understand intuitively. Drink. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask, if, by, by a quick show of hands, if uh, who has heard of uh, the term grok. It is an actual word, relatively recent. Okay. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed if so. So what we are interested in understanding better with Grokket is data on workload adoption across Red Hat products. And by workload, I'm, I'm referring to categories of applications like database or software development. And uh, there's various key workloads that we're interested in tracking. And so then we can have a better understanding of how customers are using OpenShift and RHEL. So why are we doing this? Well, here's an example business question of how we are uh, justifying our value of this, of this effort. Uh, so, for example, what software vendor partnerships should Red Hat create or enhance? Uh, the traditional approach would be interviewing customers and asking, you know, what they're running, or looking at uh, online at, say, Gartner Research. But with Rocket, we have qualitative data that helps us answer this question, so we know what vendor to prioritize for OpenShift certification or run a co-marketing campaign. So how does it work? Uh, the the one-line response is Grokket works by group by grouping running processes uh, on a system into clusters based on their similarity, and then ideally uh, each cluster corresponds to a running software application on that on that system. So our, our data is coming in through um, customers that have opted into Red Hat Insights, which is shipped by default with RHEL 8. And uh, we get data from thousands of systems, and any particular process or any particular system can have thousands of running processes. So with that multiplier effect, this really makes it ideal for a machine learning approach as opposed to a, to a manual review. So that's what I'm going to get into next is take a step back and give a brief overview of the k-means clustering algorithm, which is the approach that we are taking. So the k-means clustering intelligently groups data into K clusters based on the similarity of their features. And it is a fairly popular al algorithm, and uh, one of its more well-known use cases is with uh, recommendation engines. So for example, recommending uh, movies or songs. So let's say you're a streaming service like uh, Netflix, and you want, and, and uh, a viewer just watched a movie, and you want to keep them engaged, how are you going to figure out what to recommend? So in this example, uh, what you can do if you're the streaming service is take all of your movies and all of the uh, attributes about those movies, feed it into your algorithm, and it is going to automatically cluster those into similar movies. So for example, if you watch Avengers Endgame, um, you might also like The Dark Knight. Now that's somewhat of a trivial example because those are both really popular action movies but the algorithm can show relationships that are not familiar to the, to the naked eye, um, and it can do it faster and at scale. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about how the algorithm works under the hood. You might need to be a mathematician to, to truly do that, but it is based on calculating the distance between those numeric features, and based on how close or how far apart those features are, it will group those into, into similar clusters. So back to our use case with Grokket, we are intelligently clustering processes belonging to the same software application. So here I've got a visualization, a k-means clustering visualization, and this has k set to 3, which means there are three clusters, and they're color-coded here with a beige, a blue, and a, and a green. And so each black dot, if you can see in the, in the visualization, is a... Is a 
uh, running process on a system. So again, like I mentioned earlier, we can really feed in millions of running processes and the algorithm will, will group those into similar clusters. So I'm going to advance here and let's take a look at this beige cluster, a deep dive into it as, as a simplified example. Um, I've got four running processes shown here and uh, you can, so the end result based on the clustering is that all of the uh, processes have similar words and similar terms. So you can take a look here and see some of the similar terms for these processes. We've got forward slash bin, forward slash fluent D, you can see is common across all of these, as well as, as well as Ruby. So the algorithm has determined that these processes, they have this differentiator of having these terms, and so it puts them into the same process. Question? Literally just the process strings. Yep, so it's just the process strings. And uh, when we flip it to the Jupyter Notebook, I'll, I'll show a little bit more about how we do that. Um, and so now that we have this cluster, we can do a little bit of uh, manual research and, and with some domain expertise, we know that these processes all represent FluentD logging application, FluentD unified logging software application. So then we know that if we are if we scan a system and we see a pattern that emer a pattern where the process has Ruby and then uh, bin slash fluent D, we know that that uh, that that system and that customer is running the fluent D application. So we can label uh, the beige cluster with fluent D, and uh, there are a couple other examples of, up here: Splunk and, and MongoDB. Is there another question? Yes. Well, so think about the fact that we have, we're getting data from thousands of systems on a daily basis. And so if we were looking at um, a, uh, a pure frequency count based on these processes, the very, the, there's enough variation in the process strings that it would not become apparent. Uh, but the clustering can actually group these together so that we know that, okay, this is showing up on a ton of systems. We don't know what it is, but it's one of the most important clusters. And, uh, and then tie it back to the Fluent D application. And then from there, then you have a string that you can search all future systems on a daily basis for Fluent D. Does that answer your question? Right, right. The data is huge, and there's enough variation in the, in the process strings that uh, it would be impossible to do it with naked eye or with frequency count. And what is, what is the, um, what is the end goal of this problem? What is it used for? So, so the end goal is to be able to model uh, the presence and the prevalence of workloads and software applications running on customer systems. Whereas before, we'd have to just interview a customer or uh, do online research. But this way, we have a data-driven approach of understanding the software and workloads that customers are using for RHEL and for OpenShift. A big part of why we have insights as a product is to be able to um, anticipate problems before they happen. Whether there's something like, a, you know what a CDE is? So if there's something like that, you know that, oh, hey, this library is very commonly used with Will and D. So there's a good chance that they're going to have this library and any problems in it. And we care not just about the software we distribute, but how it interacts with the software that they're running. A lot of which is from vendors and is a, is a wider scale. So it's one of those cases where, you know, to come up with something to show in a three color graph there uh, to an audience like this is a, is a very simplified thing. I can see why it would trigger that question. But the, the, the idea is that it is to be able to learn ahead of time potential problems, potential things based on this huge data set that is constantly generating more data on a daily basis, to be able to age out all data, and to be able to see what's happening this week and this month and this year. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, yeah, just wrapping up this slide, yeah, all in all, we have over 200 um, clusters that we've tied back to software applications, and, uh, and we can then do the, the modeling from there. Another question? Great question. So the question was, I was told to repeat the question for the video, um, how do you choose the value of K? And uh, there are several approaches to do that, and we use one called the elbow method, and I can show that to you in the Jupyter Notebook, which we will get to in about just a couple minutes. Um, okay, so before we transition off the slides, I just wanted to tie it back to Anisha's uh, uh, Open Data Hub presentation. So, again, we're, use, we're building this with Open Data Hub. Uh, we use Ceph, and, uh, Ceph for our data storage, and Jupyter Hub as our coding environment. Both of these are deployed on and orchestrated by Red Hat OpenShift. And since his team has set it up for us, it's behind the scenes to us. We're just using uh, Jupyter Hub. And we uh, pull the data from Ceph into uh, Jupyter Hub. And uh, uh, we, we do that using the S3 file system protocol which uh, I think is a key point because it, it reduces the barrier to entry for using uh, the Ceph storage because the S3 protocol is the same as you, as you have with AWS S3. So you don't need to learn any new packages. Um, you can use the most popular packages like Boto3 or reading in through uh, PySpark S3 paths just like you would from, uh, from AWS. And that's what we do is we use the PySpark data frames to read in the data, uh, run some pre-processing steps, and then we use the scikit-learn package, which comes with the k-means to uh, run the ML algorithm. So that's what I have for the slides. So without further ado, we can switch over to the code. Forgive me while I... Uh, so it creates a, it spins up a new pod every time, you, and yeah, you can see it through the OpenShift UI. Okay. So it spins up a new pod every time you start your server. So how it kind of works is like you have your Jupyter Hub instance running, and that's like, you think of it as like your master. Okay. Yeah, and then um, every time a user tries logging into that interface, yep. right, um, and then they say like start my server, you select what sort of like Jupyter image you want to use. So, you know, do you want TensorFlow installed already? Do you want scikit-learn or Spark, right? And then that spins up a new pod based on that image. And it's, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to step through some code here. Um, it does take a little while to run, even with a, with a fairly small sample size, so I'm not going to run it real time, but I will just scroll down. Uh, so first we import our key packages. And then uh, here comes the uh, Spark context setup. And uh, this is where uh, we can put in the S3, or S, S3-like credentials, but for Ceph storage, and point the endpoint URL to, uh, to open Data Hub, um, and access key and secret key. And then we can set our file, our uh, key path, and uh, read in the data. And it's partitioned by year, month, and day, so we can use wildcards with the, or uh, um, basic regular expressions for capturing a certain range of months or wild cards for capturing all months or all days. And then read it into a data frame and then this is a sample of what the raw data looks like with an attachment ID for the insights upload and then the process command here. So these are all the running processes. It's just a very small sample of what we have out there obviously. Some of them are short, like etcd and sleep, but then most of these others are just truncated here, are, are, are much longer. So we do some pre-processing steps to uh, bring it into a list from data frame format, and then we, question. Yes, it's that's a unique, or does the uh, attachment ID act as, as, a, as an index? And yeah, that's like a unique identifier for that particular upload. So yes, if we did want to tie that back to an account, yes. Um. 
Um, so, okay, so with the, uh, I guess it's, it's not really acting as a key index. Uh, we don't really have a key index for this data frame. We're just going to take these processes out of the data frame and put them into a normal Python list. So it's so yeah these those those uh, attachment IDs are not unique, um, and the process list is not unique. Uh, but yeah, we don't we don't have a, a unique key index for this data frame. Um, so yeah, uh, back to the pre-processing steps. We remove some special characters that are not relevant to the analysis, and uh, we uh, uh, replace all the forward slash with spaces so that we can have each term as a, as a separate word. Um, and then we remove trailing and, and leading white spaces. And for printing out all the processes, this is how it looks after those pre-processing steps. So just a lot of process strings in there. And back to the questions we talking about earlier, we aren't looking at memory or cache or anything like that, just purely the, the process strings. Um, so I also mentioned earlier how k-means has a uh, calculates its distance or calculates the clusters based on the distance between numeric features. So we do need to convert the process strings into numeric vectors. And for that we are using the TF IDF vectorizer. As you can see here, it's just two lines of code. And uh, there's various approaches to doing this as part of the scikit-learn package. We settled with the TF IDF because uh, some of the other ones are more geared towards natural language, and but with this one, we're, with this use case, we're using machine language, so we want we uh, prefer one that does not focus on natural language processing. So then, all of the process strings are then converted into numeric vectors at this step. All right. So here's the question earlier about optimizing k. So you do need to have k specified when you're training the model. So this is kind of a brute force approach for optimizing K. It's referred to as the elbow method. And you can choose uh, how many clusters you want to go up to and arrange for that value of K. So in this example, we go from 1 to 200 clusters. And so, we so this is a step that takes a while because it trains the cluster for every value of K, as you can see here. And then it calculates the uh, sum of squared distances, which is a way of, of calculating the error or the impurity of a cluster. Um, and so, as you can see in the chart, if your k value here on the x-axis is small, then you're naturally going to have much higher impurity of your clusters because you're putting a lot of different types of processes into a small number of cluster. And then out to the right, as your k value increases, then that's where you can potentially overfit the model, and uh, and you may have different, uh, um, you may have similar processes put in different clusters because it's going to get you because it's going to return 175, 200 clusters based on the value you give. So the reason it's called elbow method, as you may suspect, is the optimal value for k is going to be somewhere in the elbow of this curve, which in this example is somewhere in that 50 to 75 range. So after running that visualization, we then train the model with k set to 50 clusters. Um, and that's the step that's done here. And once we've done that, then we've trained the model and we can start running some exploratory analysis on the model results. So for example, we can get the top terms for each cluster. And it's not necessarily the most common terms for each cluster, but it's what's at the center of that cluster from a numeric standpoint. And uh, well, I've already got it, got it scrolled down here, but the uh, cluster uh, number or, or is uh, labeled here, and it's just printing the top 10 terms for each cluster. Those, those uh, labels are not necessarily significant. It's not like cluster 0 is more important than cluster 40. Um, but you can scroll through all of them, and then in, in uh, this training run, uh, cluster 31 has some of the terms I was referencing earlier with Fluent D and with Ruby and USR and Bin. And so you can do this for all of your clusters and see if there's any key terms that jump out at you that you think, oh, that could be a running software application. 
and then and then uh, continue on down. Um, so the number of processes for each cluster does not have to stay consistent across all clusters. You can see uh, the cluster labels across the bottom, the different values for K, and the number of processes shown on the uh, Y axis. Um, so it certainly fluctuates. And we thought it was interesting that there was this big spike here for, I think it's around cluster 19 or so. And uh, when we looked into that one, it was kind of like, a, we refer to it as a junk cluster, where it, it just put a bunch of processes in there that didn't really fit well anywhere else. Uh, but that can open up additional opportunities to, send, to then run the uh, clustering algorithm on the junk cluster itself and see if and see if you can get a little bit deeper into that. So the point of using Open Data Hub and that, that architecture is for, for scale, right? And you're going to start doing um, numeric crunching or something like that that's going to blow out your tiny little laptop or, or, or something like that. Right. Where does that fit into this Jupyter Notebook? Where does this make use of that wider array of compute resources? Mm -hmm. In, in, like in, in, in this specifically, in this example that you have here, like where are you saying, oh, here's going to be kicking off into some larger thing, and how does it know to do that? Right, right. So, uh, so for example, with, with in our scenario using PySpark, um, we have the uh, so all this is an ODH instance with the Ceph storage and with the Jupyter Hub, and then if we really need to scale up our compute resource, we can from within this Jupyter notebook in ODH, we can connect to a remote Spark cluster that uh, you know can have can spin up more nodes and have as much compute power as needed. So it's it's more seamless for us. And by the way, I forgot to ask the question, but uh, the question was about how to uh, um, how does this example uh, demonstrate the use of being able to scale up, right? Scale up the compute power. Does that answer? So towards the beginning portion right. of the notebook, um, we do specify the Spark instance that you're connecting to. Okay, so it's by explicitly importing Spark, you're saying, okay, that is going to be making use. There, you have a URL in there, so there's nothing that really says, well, I'm running this notebook here, and I'm using this Spark instance here. It's, it, it's, it's, it's almost explicitly going off to something else. Something else just happens to be the OpenShift implementation you have that this notebook is running on? Yeah. They're, they're just kind of implicitly paired at this point? Well, in, in this example, this is the Spark master URL right here. So, yeah, Anish, did you want to add on to that? There's a couple of things that we, that Open Data Hub does behind the scenes. One is if you select it in Jupyter Hub that you have a Spark-enabled Jupyter notebook, it actually spins up a Spark cluster for you behind the scenes automatically, and it's your own personal Spark cluster. You can size that to whatever you want. So as you're doing your data discovery or, or your data exploration or your machine learning, you can size that independently. If you have a Spark cluster, let's say, you know, is out somewhere else on a, a Hadoop cluster, you can also point to it, but by default, we add in some environmental variables that make it automatic so that uh, your Jupyter Notebook knows how to use that resource. The other thing we're not showing here that Open Data Hub does is if you have a GPU-enabled OpenShift, then we in implicitly allow you to run your workloads on a GPU by just selecting a certain parameter when you spin up your Jupyter Notebook. That's not something that we'll show here today, but those are the types of things that Open Data Hub does for you. It's automatically configured to, to use those resources for you. So that's outside of the yes. code here. So the code yes. here is going to make use of whatever resources you create when you spin it on up. If you start doing something and you're like, oh, I need GPU, do you have to tear on down and re reload, or is it like... You would basically, so you would click on that control panel, and then there's a stop my server. You stop the server, you spin up a new one with whatever new parameters you want. If you wanted to select the GPU, you'd select the GPU, and now your workload would run on a GPU-enabled uh, container. All right, great. Yeah, so I was getting to the end of the notebook here, um, showing the number of cluster, the number of processes per cluster. I, I think there is, a, there is a, an interesting point as well, because you guys are using JupyterHub, so you have the new user, uh, by using JupyterHub, so you have multiple users spinning out new Jupyter, uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks on OpenShift, and each one of them is going to be like, I'm guessing it's going to be like a container, right? So that's a 
another another uh, uh, option that you have when you run that and not share it. That's it's, a, it's an abstraction that you know. Yes, that's true. So the, the, the Jupyter Hub, that's exactly what we're doing. It's a multi-user environment. Uh, different users, maybe there's a power user that has a, uh, access much more data than someone else that's just looking at exploratory smaller data sets. We have the ability to control how many resources, how much CPU, how much memory they're allocating per user, or we can give a default that every user gets. So that is something that we kind of glossed over. It is a multi-user environment, and, and it's allowing us to control the quotas for each data scientist. Yes, yeah. Okay, great. Well, that about wraps it up. I was just on this last um, cell, uh, code cell here. I was just going to tie it back in with the uh, Fluent D aspect earlier. Highlighted cluster number 31 as being Fluent D. And then here we can see the example processes. It's just ignore that it says 10 there because it should be 31 from uh, this latest run. But based on the pre-processing steps, it had taken out the slashes and, and uh, or forward slashes and replaced them with spaces. But it looks pretty similar compared to the example processes from the uh, from the slide earlier. And that concludes our presentation. Yes. <laughs>